All right. Well, I'm Philip, and this is Oksana. And this is Oksana. We're here to talk about uh, EAA Air Venture, informally known as uh, Oshkosh. So uh, we uh, were there in July. Um, okay. So how many people actually heard about Oshkosh? Great, awesome. So I just do a little, like a really quick introduction. So basically, it's an aviation city or other universe which exists for a week every year, and people actually do live there in uh, in tents right below the wing of their own plane. Many people fly in, some people drive in. So the city has its own infrastructure. They publish maps with uh, bus routes. Uh, they have a lot of restaurants, they have a lot of aviation activities starting from um, air shows and ending uh, with uh, you know, some sort of uh, workshops where you can build stuff. And of course, uh, there is some merchandise, so there is a fly market where you can buy a lot of stuff you never will need in your life. So for example, I bought uh, this amazing sectional blanket. <laughs> so, it says EAA Oshkosh. So let's see. Uh, yeah, I guess here is Oshkosh. So if you ever need a sectional chart, you can look into that. Actually, this is kind of perfect. That also shows the seaplane base there. Cool. Yeah, I heard that at some point they actually manufactured the, the Fisk arrivals, so arrival procedures for Oshkosh, but this is just a sectional. I mean, it's still good, right? Anyway, so uh, yeah, I also bought this uh, set of rivets. So uh, like Oshkosh was the first time in my life where I hold, like I held rivet in my hand, which was an experience. So if anyone wants a little souvenir from Oshkosh, you feel free to rip it apart and uh, we'll pass them around. Yeah. yeah. But leave one for me because I'll need it. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, hold on. So the main thing about Oshkosh is a lot of people, a lot of cool people, not just people. Um, so the thing is that there are more than 600,000 people and you want to talk to them all because they're all cool, but there is just a week of the show. So if you ever, how many people have been to Oshkosh? Oh, cool. So you guys know. If, if anyone is planning to go to Oshkosh, remember that you know air shows you can watch everywhere, but Oshkosh people are only at Oshkosh. <laughs> so another thing I want to warn you is, so I came in a F4 t-shirt, and there is a reason for that. Something I figured out uh, in a hard way was that your t-shirt at Oshkosh is your badge. Now, the way I figured this out was that I bought this t-shirt, you know, somewhere at some air show and never wore it because it has, you know, this bombing, you know, fighter plane and stuff, which I thought was too much for this country. So, <laughs> but then, you know, Philip invited me to Oshkosh and I was like, great, now I have a place to wear this t-shirt. And so one day, you know, I end up walking in Oshkosh grounds in this t-shirt and people start, you know, approaching me and asking whether I flew a four. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, but okay, then I analyzed our conversation and uh, apparently those guys were all phantom pilots and the only reason why they asked me if I flew a uh, four because they wanted to show off and told me that uh, they flew a four. <laughs> this is why I wore this Murakami t-shirt for those of you who have been to the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, I guess last spring they had a Murakami show. Yeah, but you know, jo <laughs> jokes aside, I mean, uh, I met people with uh, uh, Vietnam on their t-shirt, and guess what? They've been to Vietnam. <laughs> okay, so. And this is what part of the swag that you do get at Oshkosh, my uh, yeah. shell uh, hat from the aerobatics team. Anyway, just a couple of numbers to let you know how bad this is. So this year, I think there were 12,000 airplanes, so more than 600,000 people attending. Uh, 40,000 of them were actually camping on the grounds, which was amazing. And there's a lot of activity going on, basically. <laughs> you always want to be in 10 different places at the same time. All right. Okay, <clears throat> so my friend Ray and I began planning this uh, to go in a Cirrus uh, SR-20 back in uh, April. The uh, glorious plan was uh, to attend a, uh, an event uh, with senior management here on Sunday one of her business school classmates' uh, weddings. So we were going to leave on Monday, which is the first day of the show. 
go to Niagara Falls, walk around a bit because Ray's from Ireland and hadn't been to uh, Niagara Falls, then go to Saginaw, Michigan, and from there, precisely time our arrival to Oshkosh. We'll talk about that in a, in a moment here. And then on the way back, take in Mackinac Island, which is way up, it's quite, it's a little bit off the map, up where Lake Huron and Lake Michigan meet, uh, to Toronto, where a friend of mine uh, has a hotel, and then on uh, Clear Customs in Syracuse and back to Bedford. So the planning including getting a customs decal for the Canadian part, getting the life raft recertified, because that's about 15 minutes. Uh, we ended up being in the clouds, so it didn't uh, disturb us mentally. But uh, about 15 minutes of mental uh, disturbance over the lake. It's nice to have a raft. Uh, getting the uh, EPIRB or personal locator beacon um, battery checked and uh, stocking up on some camping gear. Then uh, Oksana joined, so our 540-pound full-fuel payload, which would have been just uh, just adequate. Uh, we included this heavy tie-down kit, which was dumb because they saw much better ones there, or rent them at the uh, show. So now we're up to uh, 29 gallons and 700 pounds, uh, and we, we would be a gross weight if everything was going perfectly. So who are the heroes? Oksana here, uh, learned in a Piper Warrior. I don't know how many of you have been following the uh, young Russian agent who took down the $4 trillion That's US government. <laughs> Maria Butina, there's a picture of her in the New York Times. She's a student pilot in a Piper Warrior. And she was able to take down the US government. So Oksana, I have high hopes for her as well. Uh, L29 pilot. Uh, also, the, uh, she's a, now a champion uh, competitor in the uh, East Coast Aero Club to cash them on. Her strengths are crypto and clouds are her weakness, but maybe that will change. Uh, so for me, I teach a, a nine-year-old to fly the SR-20. I'm one of the helicopter instructors at East Coast Aero Club. I've got uh, two type ratings for jets. Um, I used to fly the Canada Air Regional Jet for Delta. That's one of them. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, taking uh, sea turtles to uh, tax-free Florida in a PC-12. Uh, some people think of foreigners as uh, fully human, but I prefer to think of them as people who failed to obtain U.S. citizenship. So Ray is Irish, and uh, I think of him as a failure. So he's over there in Ireland flying a Hughes 400, a Hughes 500 in the R44. He owns, uh, he's a retired business guy. He owns a flight school as well. So there's Ray. You can see why we were, uh, between him and me, why we were bumping up against gross weight. You can be far off time to join. Um, okay, so I'll take over. Uh, okay, so arrival at Oshkosh is a little bit funny. Uh, so this year they had 19,000 aircraft operations per week for week of Oshkosh, and it's actually the busiest air, uh, airport in the world for the duration of the event, just like the sign on the control tower says. So you can see this chart, it's from last year, but numbers are roughly the same every year. So it's, you know, among the top uh, busy US universities, but, oh sorry, university <laughs> airports. <laughs> Hard to be a PhD student and a pilot at the same time. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it has a, uh, less operations than, let's say, Chicago, Air, Chicago airport, but uh, the letter was open 24 hours uh, per day, but uh, Oshkosh Airport only operates uh, for about 10 hours. So really you have more landings per minute. And uh, just to give you an idea, so this is a picture from our departure from Oshkosh. So everybody is flying away, but this is actually only a small part of all traffic. So you kind of see everybody here. And as you can imagine, when you have such a swarm of crazy pilots, you need some way to organize them. Now, if you look at all big international airports, they have you know the whole system of uh, air traffic control working to set you know to provide a safe separation for traffic. So when the airplane comes into the airport, you know long before it reaches the airport, air traffic control works to actually make sure they arrive in order in sequence. Because if all planes come in the same time, what do you do with that, right? So here, Oscars doesn't have it. So it's up to pilots to sort of self-organize to make sure they all arrive in a nice order and then land one by one. So of course this would be impossible without some predetermined rules. And so that's why they published this huge document, which is called a Nautilus, uh, which basically tells you, you know, how do you arrive and how do you sequence with other people 
and where the hold is, what to do with hold the school, etc., etc. So it's kind of crazy, you know, whom do you talk to? Uh, basically, there is a tower at Oshkosh with some uh, controllers, but they only kick in at the very last phase of uh, your flight, when you are already uh, landing. So basically they tell you which runway to go. And before that there is sort of, you know, you're supposed to study this and uh, know what to do in the air. And the, it's amazingly safe actually, you know, for 12,000 airplanes arriving, you, you might think, you know, there would be some mishaps. Of course, everybody wants to fly in like on Sunday or Monday, right? There's like two arrival days, maybe three departure days. Uh, you might think there will be some, you know, mishaps and... Uh, but really, it's very safe. This time there was no uh, problems related to like air, any collisions. And uh, so one thing Oshkosh has, which other airports don't, uh, is you can see those dots on the runway. So basically, normally only one plane takes the runway, but in Oshkosh, they might instruct you to land on the dot, and you can see another airplane landing same runway, different dot at the same time. So this is just the way to speed up the, the crazy traffic. There are different colors, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Monday. Um, it had been actually bad weather you know, in the Midwest, it was marginal VFR at best near Oshkosh, and there were thunderstorms just parking themselves all over the Northeast. Um, my friend uh, Richard actually gave me good advice, which is, you know, don't even start worrying about the uh, weather until just uh, a few hours before the flight, because you, know, you just don't know what it's going to look like, even if the prog chart is showing just solid uh, rain across the whole route. Don't worry about it. So it turned out not to be as bad. We'll show you the route. We ended up, we ended up, we did end up going farther north to uh, Watertown, New York, rather than straight west to Niagara. Uh, we actually kind of uh, screwed up the camping a bit. Um, the busiest time, the campground is at its very busiest probably Monday or Tuesday of the event. A lot of people arrive Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then people begin to leave Wednesday or Thursday. So you either want to arrive maybe Saturday or Sunday or you want to arrive uh, Wednesday or Thursday if you want to get a decent camping spot. So when we were on the ground uh, in, uh, at the Niagara Falls uh, airport, we uh, heard that the uh, airplane parking was full at Oshkosh. People were having to go to other airports. There's no way to make a reservation in advance, except actually for ramp parking, I guess, with uh, Basler, the FBO at Oshkosh. Um, and uh, the camping was filling up. So we launched from Niagara Falls, uh, we skipped out on that whole uh, arrival procedure. Uh, Oksana ridiculed me for it, said that was part of the Oshkosh experience, was to go to Rikon, line up with everybody else, and land on the dot. Um, but uh, we had IFR uh, reservations, and we ended up, uh, that ended up being a great thing, because see this headline, the mass arrivals finally make it to Oshkosh. People were holding for hours, they would show up at right on and the controllers were telling them, you know, go into a hold and they would just sit there for two, three hours and eventually have to uh, and depart uh, to refuel um, because the marginal weather had uh, batched people up into uh, some fairly compressed slots. So the whole thing this year was a mess, uh, but for us it was pretty easy. Uh, we landed at 225, they told us to get out. Um, we were in a minimum fuel situation, so I said, sorry, I can't do it. Uh, so we, land, we, we, we parked temporarily on the ramp of the FBO, got fuel, and meanwhile a friend of mine who's on the board of EAA uh, got him to open up a camping spot. All right, a few photos. Here's, uh, here's what we were dealing with. It looks really ugly on Nextrad, but actually uh, when we were flying through it, you know, the green parts, it, it wasn't bad at all. Uh, here's Niagara Falls that Ray snapped. Uh, there is what you see when you arrive IFR. It's just like any other IFR flight. You come in over the lake, you land uh, pretty much straight ahead on, uh, I guess that's runway 27, and you roll out, and it doesn't change until you taxi off the runway, at which point you know, you're being marshaled by uh, people giving you hand signals instead of talking to ground. Uh, the first thing that we saw was a P-51 Mustang. There's just uh, whole rows of them there, and then this is the One Week Wonder that Oksana will tell you about more later. Uh, some folks building a kit airplane in one week. Uh, the V-1 bomber is kind of typical of the big hardware in the central, central part of the uh, show. 
Uh, here's a plane from 1928 at the top left, the Lincoln Page. And then that, uh, that's a replica of Pitcairn uh, Autogyro from the Amelia Earhart days. Uh, that's a Cessna 170 at the bottom, center and left. And I think it might be a, a Piper Comanche. I don't know if I'm not uh, misstating that. But you can, see the, uh, you can see the guys in the back there, one of the aerobatic teams. Um, a lot of unusual airplanes there, as well as antiques. Uh, so if you're really feeling brave, you can build your own helicopter. That's the Safari kit. Uh, Piper Cubs, of course, there's plenty of those. Uh, bottom left is a 1928 Travel Air, and that was sitting in a whole row of 1920s Travel Air airplanes with people camped out next to them. Uh, and then here's a Wilga. It's a Polish, I believe, um, short field airplane. And uh, this guy, Mike Paley, he put in uh, fuel tanks in these struts. Somehow he claims that it gives more reliable fuel supply during extreme maneuvers. And a PT-6 uh, turbine engine where there had been uh, a piston engine. And he goes into the back country with his wife all the time. Um, OK, this is just on a Monday afternoon walk around. There are five airworthy Piaggio P-136 airplanes in the world today, and we saw two of them park, park right next to each other uh, at Oshkosh. So that's the kind of thing you can't see even at Sun and Fun uh, in Florida, which is also an EAA event. Uh, not nearly as many of these unusual uh, airplanes. And then if you're a fan of you know, boat-style seaplanes, there just every kind of Grumman was there, uh, row after row of them. Uh, there's, a, there's some kind of uh, big family camping out of a DC-3. Here's our campsite. We were right next to the Warbirds. It was a slot that had been reserved for EA volunteers, but they ended up not filling up that area. So uh, they opened it up for us. Um, and then other people as well began and came in. Actually, there was a member of the uh, of my class. I'm class of 82 at MIT, and I was the secretary of the class as well. And one of my classmates uh, was there right next to us uh, in a Cessna with his two kids in a camp that was organized with military precision. He was uh, from the West, and he would go all over the back country with the kids camping out. And this, let this be a lesson to you for your, uh, your engineering careers. We discovered that despite his manifest competence, he'd been He'd been fired from his engineering job once he, once he hit his early 50s. We asked a, a guy who was with us who worked for a big HR consulting firm, how is it possible they would fire you know, somebody as such a great engineer? And the uh, HR expert said, that's simple, stale, pale, and male. <laughs> he went to the innovation forum. I don't know why these people in aviation, they have no sense of irony. They parked a 1970s certified Piper Seminole in front of their innovation <laughs> forum. Uh, this was kind of interesting. There was a professor from Embry-Riddle uh, who talked about how you know we haven't really seen anything yet with uh, electric uh, aircraft because people are kind of doing what they did, you know, towards the uh, end of the 1940s, which is sticking jet engines into piston airframes. You know, now we see a lot of aircraft that kind of look like a Piper uh, Warrior or uh, Cessna 152, and the piston engine's been taken out, the electric engine's been put in, but uh, that's probably not, you know, the ultimate uh, place that the vehicles are going to go. Just like you know, today's jet fighter doesn't really look like a World War II uh, piston air airframe that was converted to jet. Uh, for those of you who want to learn to fly, the uh, VP from Boeing, I guess, uh, was talking about 800,000 new pilots being needed. And uh, there's a huge demand for new airframes, I guess, in, uh, in Asia. Uh, then a, a guy who appeared to be about half the age of these typical, I mean, your typical Oshkosh event looks like a Donald Trump rally, a lot of white guys in their 50s. Uh, but then, you know, here was this Bay Area hipster barging into the forum. And he said, basically, you know, Uber's theory is that, you know, population growth uh, in the U.S. and worldwide, plus urbanization is going to make cities just uh, melt down completely as far as ground transportation is uh, concerned. And what Uber is doing is designing uh, open source electric aircraft designs in the hopes that other people will manufacture these things and they can operate them starting in uh, 2023 in Los Angeles. I don't know, maybe they are going to uh, 
by everybody at the FAA, uh, a lifetime supply of uh, Xanax or something. Um, <laughs> but supposedly they'll be taking four people at a time for 100 bucks on uh, you know 30 mile hops around LA. Uh, okay. So one thing about Oshkosh that's kind of interesting is a huge number of people paint their aircraft. You know, they built it, now they need to paint it, uh, or they have an antique airplane that they want to paint, or they just, uh, you know, have an older airplane that they are passionate about and they want to repaint. So there's a guy there who started out as an engineer, I think civil or something else, not really related to aesthetics, but he uh, developed a passion and a skill for uh, aircraft uh, schemes. I, these slides are going to be available at the end. Uh, you'll get the URL. Uh, he's got an interesting webinar that I would encourage you guys to uh, look at, which talks about you know what works and what doesn't work. With lots of examples of airplanes. The Cirrus. Why the Cirrus? The Cirrus has never looked that great, in my view. And the company has tried lots of different paint schemes, none of which have been fully successful. Uh, he says basically the issue with the Cirrus is that the airplane is pregnant. So they, you know, because they could do composite they were able to kind of widen out the front part of the cabin, um, but it doesn't have the elegant shape of the metal airplanes. So they're able to build these arbitrary shapes because it's all plastic, <laughs> but the result is an airplane that's very difficult. You have to kind of use paint to disrupt the lines of the aircraft because it's not a naturally beautiful airplane. Um, he talked about, uh, I asked him, you know, well, Commercial vehicles now, they just start out with a white vehicle and then wrap the whole thing in vinyl if they wanted to have a design. Why not do that with aircraft? You know, he said basically, okay, the ownership period is longer than for a road vehicle. Uh, sun exposure is kind of the same issue. But also aircraft, you know, every year they sort of get taken apart, all the inspection panels come off and stuff. So he said it ends up not looking as good as it does on a, on a car. Uh, the split base, having a darker color on the bottom, is popular. Uh, the chrome spinner idea, he doesn't like. He says if the uh, spinner is painted the same color as the airplane, it makes it look longer. A lot of ideas. Um, he said uh, one thing that he liked was painting the top of the wing so you can kind of enjoy it in flight. And he said uh, a lot of his customers have been sued by their wives, so he recommends um, to avoid a divorce lawsuit using the wife's initials as the tail number. Does uh, it work? I don't know if he has good data. <laughs> okay, so we met a bunch of round the world pilots. Uh, we met uh, Dick Rutan, uh, Bert Rutan's uh, brother. What else? Let's have a quiz for the audience. Aside from aircraft design, what else is Bert Rutan famous for the last few years? He's a global warming skeptic. Climate change denial, that's right. All right, prize for hockey. <laughs> a book by my favorite author. <laughs> Thank you. All it's right. written by Phil. <laughs> <laughs> so he was there, and a uh, very interesting guy who did this um, nine-day uh, non-stop in a Brutan-designed airplane, the first, I guess, unrefueled non-stop around the world. Uh, Shyesta Waiz was there. I don't know how you pronounce your name exactly. She's from California, um, originally uh, from Afghanistan. Um, she did a trip over about half a year, stopping in 22 countries, solo in a bonanza. That was interesting, actually. She said the overwater legs were actually the easiest because the weather is mostly over the land once you get over the water, except for the intertropical convergence zone at the equator where there's a lot of thunderstorms. Uh, generally, once you're over water, uh, the weather settles down. The most impressive person of the list, in some ways, to me, was an Italian uh, SR-22 owner. And he just comes to Oshkosh almost every year. He get, walks out to the airplane in Italy, loads in two, pretty other, two other pretty heavy set guys and all their gear for survival over the North Atlantic and camping in Oshkosh, turns the key, and goes. So for him, this is just how he gets to Oshkosh every year, flying over the North Atlantic. Um, and I was very impressed with him. All right, so while I was goofing off talking to uh, guys from Italy, uh, Oksana was actually learning something, so she yes. can talk about that. Okay, so the coolest thing, in my opinion, was the One Week Wonder Project. So basically, it's a project at Oshkosh, you know, during the duration of Oshkosh. 
to build the whole airplane from the kit, something from the kit. So they build this RV. So they have a group of volunteers working on it. But um, the cool thing that is that everyone can actually go there and pull a rivet. And leave, you can leave your rivet in this airplane. So they have this uh, clocks showing how many days and hours uh, are left till the end. And they actually managed to do this in time. Something happened. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Help. Switched off. Okay. Let's just time it out. Time ran out. There you go. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, time ran out. <laughs> oh, I just started. You talk too much, you know. What's what? Maybe it's. Uh, Alright, I'm going to let this be a lesson to you guys while they're fixing this. Whenever you're giving a talk, never bring your own laptop, <laughs> never run the slides, always make it somebody else's problem. <laughs> you see? Now, instead of you guys saying, Philip and Oksana, they're supposed to know something about computers. Look how incompetent they are. Instead, you're thinking, well, this Lockie guy, you know, I hope he's not a course sex major. <laughs> I think it's all on him. I think we should be pretty good. Okay. Thanks. All right, so now here is the wing on the right. So you can see it's reflecting everything. It's not painted yet. And you can see this row of rivets coming. And if you look closely, you can see the people's names. So every rivet has a name of a person who actually pulled it. And I also left my own name somewhere. Yeah, right there. And uh, then, you know, uh, on Sunday it was already, it was uh, test flown by the guy who is uh, the test pilot. And if you look closely at this, do you know what this is? Probably, yes. So, you know, this is the fuselage, it's reflecting the wind which goes this way. And the wind has all those, you know, rivet rows and it has all people's names on it. So basically the whole wings are covered with people's signatures, which was pretty cool. Okay, so another cool thing was the wood workshop. Uh, so the point of this uh, workshop was to demonstrate that you know building the plane from the using wood is not something like super difficult. And you know, as a little project, uh, they were using this uh, wooden rib. So I made it myself. There is a mistake. Somebody can see mistake. So this is a part of uh, the win, right? So you have a, a lot of them. Uh, so you can see this on the scheme that says far opening, right? So this far is this big, uh, you know, metal or wooden uh, block, which basically is a backbone of the wing, and it's supposed to go through <coughs> this part. And as you can see, this uh, thing will, you know, prevent it from doing that. So apparently, I was not paying attention, and this thing is supposed to go slightly further. So, but the point of wood is that actually mistakes are very easy to fix. And if I was not too lazy, I could actually, you know, easily fix it. So this was kind of cool. So they're using uh, staplers, you know, staples to attach those uh, piece of wood to the uh, conjunction. And, but you need to remove that because uh, uh, the metal will uh, make the wood rot, which you don't want to do. So they also had this cool, uh, you know, stand with the. Uh, all information about what kind of wood can or cannot you use in an airplane. So they have, you know, different things like if there is a crack, obviously you don't want to use this wood. If there is a knot in the wood, if it's not too big, you can use it in some places, in some places you cannot. If there is rot, you know, you just throw it away. So, okay, there was, you know, <laughs> the best uh, workshop about disassembling a light common engine. It was two hours of hell for me because I don't understand anything about <coughs> engines. But the cool thing I learned about it, you know, you need all kind of devices to, you know, extract things from engine, like bolts or rods or stuff, which are usually sitting tight. And, you know, he would grab some device and ask people, how much do you think this device costs? And this device is not even part of the engine, right? It's just to pull something out of the engine, like a bolt. And he was like, how much do you think this costs? Somebody will say, you know, 500 bucks. He was like, okay, add one digit. So something costed like, freaking 5,000 bucks, okay? And then he took another device and said, 
We made this ourselves from a 30 bucks road from this place and 20 bucks thing from that place and you know, uh, it took us one hour to do that. And it's doing the same thing, 50 bucks. Okay, uh, this was really interesting. So as you know, uh, some planes have to be hand props to start them. And actually, if you um, go to the YouTube video and look how people do it, it looks very simple. Basically, the person just walks into the prop, you know, and moves the prop, and uh, it starts. Let's see if we can do it. <coughs> That's you. Let's go start on the first pool. Watch this. See how easy it is? Watch this. Hold my beer and watch this. That's it, right? So looks looks like it's very simple, and it's, it is kind of simple, but there is a trick, and the trick is not to fall, you know, into the propeller. <laughs> so there is certain technique uh, how you want to do this. So the thing is, so let's say this is the blade of the propeller. If you ask a person to move something which is hard to move down, what he will do is he will grip uh, with a tight grip, and he kind of pushes this, and once it will go down by itself, it will he will fall. This. So you don't want to do that. So that's why, if you can see in the picture, I don't grip the prop. I really press my hands, my palms on it, and you're gonna, you know, stretch your leg like this and do this nice movement downward and step back. Also, if you uh, put your fingers around the blade like this, if the prop, the engine misfires, the prop can move backwards slightly, just a little bit, but it will be enough to hit your fingers. It will not be a fun experience. So yeah, so there are some tricks and like everything in aviation, you just need to get some training to do this nicely. Okay, so I visited a bunch of talks. I won't be talking about all of them, but I really wanted to talk about some very cool stuff I learned. So there is this guy, Mike Bush. Um, so basically, he runs some company who collects all the data from uh, general aviation engines. And he was talking about what they learned using this data. So one thing which maybe you know interests a lot of us is do we get more headwinds than tailwinds, right? Because you know it's na it's people's nature that you tend to remember bad stuff and not good stuff. So you might think that okay, every time I fly, I get a headwind, but uh, is it just something you know? Is it just the way your memory works, or do you really get headwind all the time? So what do you think? Like, do you get more headwinds or tailwinds? Why? <laughs> Why? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, right, so there are usually two like, popular answers. So the first answer is you should get 50% uh, tailwind, 50% headwind, right? Just because uh, right, there is 50% probability that the wind will come from the forward, from front. Another uh, answer is that you'll get more headwind because you spend more time flying into headwind, right? If I go somewhere and come back, if I spend 30 minutes going that way because I had a tailwind uh, helping me, and then I, come, I spend maybe an hour coming back because of a headwind, right? So now I spend one hour in a headwind and 30 minutes in tailwind. So what's the answer, right? So here's the answer. So there is a diagram which shows the true airspeed and uh, the ground speed. Right? And if you can see, the median ground speed is actually smaller than the true airspeed, meaning that you do get more headwind on average than tailwind. Now, the first thing he said is, OK, so probably this is just uh, the way we compute things, right? Which makes sense. You spend more time uh, in a headwind. But then he realized that the way they computed it actually already accounts for the scat. So this is even worse than that. Uh, so for a 140 knot airplane, you could get 5% more headwinds on average than tailwinds. And uh, he was really curious what the reason for this is. So it's not just this issue of time, because they already accounted for that. In it is. So the reason is that, you know, you might think you have you know, 180 degrees of headwind, 180 degrees of tailwind, but it's not the case. So if you think about, so let's say we have a wind which is almost a straight crosswind, but it's a little bit from behind. So formally speaking, this is still tailwind, right? No, no, no. <laughs> no, but it's, it's very sidewind. 
Yeah, so you might think, formally speaking, this is tailwind, right? But then, if you get this kind of wind, what do you do? If I just keep flying straight, I won't be, be there, I will be somewhere else, right? Because I'll be pushed by the wind. So what do we do in aviation? We crab into the wind, right? So really, if I have this wind, I will fly this way. And the way, this way, the wind will push me that way, where I, I want to go. So really, when you have the wind, which is a little bit tailwind, in reality, because you crab into the wind, it becomes a headwind. So if you look at this arc, you get much more headwinds than tailwinds. And so this, uh, they did some computation, and this was actually uh, really, uh, uh, it was giving the same numbers as they got from the data. So another cool thing, you know, this was, you know, you might say, so what, right? Okay, it's interesting to know, but so what? So the cool thing they could get is they could actually predict some failures. Uh, so, for example, they could predict the failure in exhaust valve because they, you know, they analyzed data and they learned what this valve looks like on EGT graph. So they know the signature of a valve which is going to fail. So if you s keep sending uh, them your data, they can actually analyze it and tell you, look, you should really, really check your valve. Okay, so another thing um, I didn't know really was about uh, TFRs. So as you probably know, TFRs are temporary flight restrictions. So they usually set them, you know, in some uh, sensitive areas. Like if you have, you know, I don't know, the White House or Pentagon or something, there is an area of no fly zone there. Also, some old men apparently like playing golf in New Jersey. So they would often put a no fly zone in New Jersey. So now the thing about TFRs is, or any restricted airspace, um, for that matter, is you know you're looking at your iPad, right? You have the GPS, and you are, you see you're outside of it, so you just keep flying. Now the thing is, you know, if somebody thinks you violated the air airspace, they won't be looking at your iPad pictures. They will be looking at pictures they you know grab from the radar of ATC. So it's important that on the ATC radar picture you are not in the restricted airspace. And for that, it's actually good you know, to stay far away enough to make sure that you know, no glitch, no delay will you know, influence your position um, just to be on the safe side. Yeah. Pushing problems to other people. So basically, then the tower is responsible for you being out of all that airspace. OK, so I also want to uh, Philip's talk, but maybe I let Philip talk about it. All right, so I gave a talk. Uh, Called anybody, any of you guys can uh, give a talk at EAA. All you have to do is uh, go to the website, figure out what you want to say, and uh, volunteer. So then they decide how interesting are these talks, and they'll slot them into a time. So you can see this one. My talk was scheduled for 8:30 a.m. on Wednesday. So uh, uh, raise your hand if you've seen the movie Spinal Tap. Remember towards oh, the older folks. Yeah, remember towards the end they began playing and bigger and bigger halls to smaller and smaller audiences. So uh, we, we did have about 75 uh, people who showed up. Um, one interesting thing about this, and the slides are linked from here. Uh, so a nine-year-old uh, a nine-year-old girl was looking at my, uh, my printed out list of talks that I was planning to attend at Oshkosh, and she zeroed in. Out of all the talks, she said, well, this one's really stupid. <laughs> So which, which one, Greta? She said, helicopters for airplane pilots. If they're airplane pilots, why do they want a helicopter? Uh, and then she kept reading, and she found Turtles Fly too. And she's like, that sounds like a, a book for a three-year-old. I said, well, I'm, I'm going to give part of that talk as well. Uh, anyway, so that was, uh, that was not great. Um, OK, so one cool thing about uh, EAA is in addition to the uh, elderly uh, white gentleman, uh, they do a lot of stuff for uh, kids, trying to bring them into the uh, home building and aviation uh, world. So there's a lot of, you know, I guess a lot of kids today, you know, they may not have experience hammering and using drivers and tin snips and stuff. So there's all these uh, volunteers in the vintage hangar. And also, over, EAA runs a museum year-round at Oshkosh, and they have something called the Pioneer Airport there with a lot of older airplanes. And over there, they also run a sort of a junior a and uh, area where kids can uh, practice planing and uh, 
some electrical work and they get their little junior A and P license. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Terrafugia, an MIT spinoff, they actually did produce uh, a cert fully certified uh, rotable aircraft, and there it is, right there in the AA Museum. Bears a remarkable resemblance to the 1949 uh, Taylor Aero car. All right, uh, which is actually fully FAA certified. Uh, so yeah, they have a nice little museum there, a whole big section up at the top right devoted to Burt Rutan uh, designs. Uh, they have uh, out parked outside all kinds of interesting airplanes, uh, military planes and stuff. That's a Grumman Duck from uh, World War II. The nose art that uh, was appropriate for kids during World War II, uh, now uh, today's tender generation has to have the parental uh, trigger warning before going and looking at the nose art. If you download these slides and look carefully, you'll see they made strategic use of some of the rivet, rivets and bolt heads uh, there in the airplane. And you guys may not know, but they actually have Elizabeth Warren in the museum. They have Elizabeth Warren's uh, air racing trophy. Or it might have been given to Paul Poberesny, a founder of EAA, for some sort of air race. Uh, he is an interesting guy. You might say, you know, what kind of person would want to go from a high-performance certified airplane into a simple home-built slow airplane? Uh, the guy who started EAA, he was flying the highest-performance airplanes of the day. A P-51 Mustang, he was in the U.S. Air Force, uh, the P-38, a couple of which are parked right outside the museum. And, you know, when he left the Air Force, he came, I don't know, went down into his basement and started cutting airplanes uh, out of plywood with 100 horsepower engines. It's kind of, uh, you know, interesting that somebody would be so inspired by, you know, the dream of building uh, his or her own airplane that uh, this person would be indifferent to the fact that the performance was, you know, one one hundredth of a certified airplane that they had recently flown, like a B-51. Um, so this gets into the, uh, you know, Oshkosh is a safe space idea. So this guy built 15 years, he and his wife built a two-seat rotorway helicopter kit, and they stuffed a turbine engine into it. So they ended up, after 15 years of work, with, an air, with a helicopter that has way less performance and utility than a Robinson R44. After 15 years, they've flown 43 hours, which is what an East Coast Aero Club R44 Robinson will do in two weeks during the summertime. Um, you know, you can't justify this rationally. If they had worked at minimum wage, uh, you know, at a McDonald's and just saved their money, they would have had enough to buy a factory new R44, I'm pretty sure. So, but at Oshkosh, nobody's gonna say, that's, you know, that's just not smart. You know, you could have bought an old Cessna and painted it, you know, fire engine red and flown around, you know, uh, a month later in a really uh, functional airplane. So people just do all kinds of things that, you know, aren't really, they can't be justified rationally, but uh, that's what's cool about Oshkosh. Here's a Rutan Long Easy into which a guy put a turbo in, turbojet engine. Here's a $42,000 jet that anybody can buy. I'm not sure that it includes the little engine, but it's still not all that much. Uh, then there's the certified world. Oshkosh is not really about sales, but the manufacturers have booths nonetheless. Uh, so there's two ends of the spectrum. So one end, end of the spectrum is Cirrus. They were there with an airplane that was the 7,000th that they built. Let's get back to paint designs. See how they've kind of sort of fuzzed up the lines of it. They're trying to distract your eye from the actual shape of the airplane. That's what I got from the paint scheme guy. All the Cirrus designs have this disruptive uh, flow, unlike, say, a TBM, which uh, the guy considered to have an inherently beautiful shape. That's me with uh, one of the founders of uh, Cirrus. There was a dynamic, uh, sort of uh, voluble guy named Alan. They, kicked him out of the company, and uh, they kept the uh, more sober uh, brother, Dale. Uh, Icon was also there. I told people, if you missed, Osh I was at Oshkosh last in 2010. I said, if you missed uh, Oshkosh in 2010, Icon was there with the same plane, the same promise delivery uh, timeline, and uh, about triple the uh, 
price for 2010. So Icon's kind of the opposite. They've got 1,250 airplanes that they took orders for, but they've hardly delivered any. Cirrus has uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of revolutionized the family airplane, I guess it's fair to say, uh, with the 7,008 Gulls uh, and the parachute. Pipistrelle, I think, is the most interesting of the uh, certified uh, companies. It's, uh, they come from Slovenia, like Melania Trump. And uh, they have this, this guy as a retired Air Force fighter pilot, and then a retired, and he worked at Southwest Airlines, and he recently was pushed out at age 65. Uh, so it's all electric. This propeller uh, can pop up at any time. Um, and there's some solar panels on the roof and also can live in that trailer there. It comes with this trailer which has solar panels. So they can trailer it anywhere, self-launch, and go glide around. So Pipistrel is a very, very interesting company, and uh, I would encourage you to watch, watch what they're up to. All right, the joys of camping. So camping seems like a great idea, uh, and then they issued this uh, special weather statement, talked about winds up to 45 miles per hour, uh, even the B-1 bomber, those guys got scared and they took off about 45 minutes before the storm really hit. Uh, it was actually louder. When they took off, it was louder than any of the thunder that we finally got hit with. So the $99 Costco tent, tent that was about, had a really high profile, it seemed like a great idea. Actually, it was probably, you could stand up in the middle. But uh, fortunately, the three of us, uh, my friend John also came in from Austin, Texas. He flew in commercial with his rental car. Uh, Ray, John, and I, we all sat in the corners of the tent bracing it. Oksana had her own little backpacking tent next door with a low profile, but that was a little scary. So um, I'm not as much of a fan of uh, camping as Oksana, but she's going to talk about uh, what's great about camping. Yes, I think it's a part of Oshkosh experience. So we really were lucky to get to this spot right near the runway. So you can see the plane taking off. You know, you know, it looks small, but in reality it was all very close. So basically, you know, every morning at 6 a.m., whether you want it or not, you kind of wake up because all those bombers are flying almost above your head. I really, you know, I was very curious, the whole Oshkosh, you know, 6 a.m. people start flying, but air show starts at 1.30 p.m. or something. Like, where are all they going, right? Like, if it's a arrival day, I can understand everybody comes in. If it's departure, I can also understand. Like, in the middle of Oshkosh, like, where the hell people are going? Like, since 6 a.m. everybody's flying. But then I talked to people, and the answer was, of course, obvious. They fly because they can, basically. Uh, so, another mandatory picture from Oshkosh is the towels, uh, you know, uh, drying out in the sun on the propeller. If you ever go to Oshkosh, you know, the first thing you should do is make sure you buy those clamps and, uh, you know, can make the picture and post it online somewhere. Uh, so, you no know, jokes aside, uh, you know, it's, camping is very cheap there. Honestly, I would, buy, I would pay like 400 bucks just to be able to camp there, but in reality, the price was 24 bucks per night. And uh, you know, they're just for the whole spot. So we basically divided it for four people. And if you look up uh, the hotels for the next year, Oshkosh, it's already all booked. You cannot uh, buy a, get a hotel right now. Maybe for the next for the, like, two years in ahead, you can do that. But right now, all the hotels are already all booked. Right. All right. The seaplane base is the quiet part of Oshkosh. Uh, where quiet is defined as no more than three aircraft engines running at any one time and no more than uh, two takeoffs happening. Uh, whoops. So there is an air cam. I don't know. I think, I think there's a Piper Cub in the uh, back there. And that's an air cam, which is, uh, I guess this is one with the canopy. Usually it's kind of an open air airplane. There is some commercial action. There's four hangars of vet vendors that are primary, so people who have smaller booths and unusual, uh, you know, little products, electronic flight bags, or in this case, a dog oxygen uh, system, so you can take your dog up to uh, 17,000 feet or whatever in your SR-22T. Um, there's uh, different affinity groups, so if you're uh, if you identify as a slender female, uh, you can be a, one of the Mooney girls. Uh, if you don't identify as Slender, I wouldn't recommend the Mooney. Uh, I, uh, you can get a rainbow, what are those, what does that say, Rain, rainbow airplane beads from the uh, Gay Pilots Association. 
Uh, here, the local sexual assault group had rented out a booth. I'm not sure that everybody got the message, though, because right next to their booth was the Beertopia uh, booth. And then there's a private landowner right next to the Oshkosh Airport. The EAA has been trying to buy out these people. Uh, they've refused to sell and they run Beer Venture all through this case. <laughs> and they advertise, you can't, I don't know how well you can see the picture, they advertise bikini bartenders, and they actually do deliver on that. So, uh, okay. Oksana's gonna talk about uh, the federal, inside the federal, there's an additional hangar, which is just for government stuff, and as part of that, uh, there's a, a simulator. Yeah, about. so that was a really cool thing. So basically, they have a simulator for the uh, Wright Brother, Brother Flyer. So just to give you an idea of uh, how it felt to be a pilot of the Wright Brother uh, Flyer. So basically, you have a line on the wing. And here, there is a handle for the elevator control. And now, uh, so there is this you know cradle, which you move with your hips, which was connected to you know, what was then was ailerons, right? They had this wing wrap system, uh, which now uh, progressed to ailerons. So really your roll control was on your hips. You were supposed to move your body, you know, right and left uh, to control the plane. And so that's what they basically did. So this is the, you know, part of the wing. Uh, the guy is lying like, like this. So there is this cradle, which allows you to roll the plane. And there is elevator control. And uh, so we have some flight model for that, which people say it's actually pretty accurate. So it was a hell of unstable airplane. You know, there was some sweet spot uh, where you want to keep your you know, visual picture. If you go higher than that, you will start you know, pitching up. If you go lower, you start pitching down. You should be also very careful with rolls because if you start rolling, immediately you should start rolling the other direction. Otherwise, you cannot recover from this roll. Uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. So the way my journey ended was that, you know, there was no separate uh, rudder control. It was connected to ailerons. Uh, so it was not perfect, of course. And eventually I ended up in a huge uh, side slip. So I was going, you know, some direction and looking in the other direction. And unfortunately, in the direction I was going, but not looking, there was a tree. So this is how <laughs> my journey ended. All right. So every day there's an air show. One thing that you know, but uh, as Oksana was saying, Ox, most people who come to Oshkosh, there's probably about 100,000 people a day who are there. Most of them are there to talk to other people who are passionate about aviation. The visitors who come in, you know, just for the day from Chicago, uh, they are really passionate about the air show, but the average person in Oshkosh may not even look up after a day or two. Uh, but we did spend some time looking at the air show. My personal favorites actually start with regular airplanes. So there are some people who will take, you know, a Beechcraft Baron that's not been in any way uh, beefed up. It's still in, uh, you know, its ordinary original certification class and just fly it to its, its limits. Uh, so that's fascinating to see what can be done with a regular uh, old airplane as long as you have the waiver off, a waiver of uh, no aerobatic maneuvers. Uh, there is, Beech actually made a, about 150, I think, or 100 of uh, their regular bonanzas, but reinforced, so they can do some pretty serious aerobatics in this you know, four-seat family airplane. It's the four-seat uh, bonanza, not the six-seater. Um, there's this uh, Yak-110 uh, here at the right, which is gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, the Red Bull helicopter, which has a rigid rotor system, and therefore can do loops and rolls. Uh, Patty Wagstaff was there doing, she has just really innovative aerobatics, stuff that nobody else does, very creative. Uh, and then Mike Goulian, who's not super creative, uh, but he's, you know, unbelievably accomplished. He's an Air Bull, a Red Bull uh, air racer. Uh, he actually uh, is based at Bedford. His family ran executive uh, flyers for decades. Um, and he was there, you know, doing uh, stuff that requires tremendous level of skill and physical fitness. Uh, one thing I like and I encourage you guys to check out is uh, there's an aerobatic champion from Germany uh, who got together with some aeronautical uh, engineers from England and the Walmart family's money and built this uh, solid block of carbon fiber called the Game Bird, which you can now buy for 400 grand. It's not actually that much more than a decathlon. And he was doing some incredible uh, things in the Game Bird. There's the night um, air show. Uh, here we are getting ready to watch. 
So the night air show is interesting. You have airplanes. How many people have seen a night air show? Cool. Guys who were at Oshka, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Warbirds. So they have a whole Warbird section, DC-3s, there's a Spitfire, uh, two kinds of Grumman's. Those Tiger Cats I'd never even seen. I, didn't, I had to look them up you know, on Wikipedia. I'd never even heard of them, these uh, F-7s. Uh, P-51 Mustangs are very common. Here's something that you won't see everything, won't see everywhere. Uh, there is a B-17 and there is a one-third scale flyable B-17 that some guy built over, you know, another 15-year uh, period. Uh, EAA, I think this is EAA's own B-29. Um, that's my friend Eric. He actually operates, he mostly uh, runs a Pilatus uh, charter operation, but he also is involved in this uh, nonprofit that operates a DC-3 and they're flying a whole bunch of them over to Europe for the anniversary of D-Day next year. Um, okay, here's an interesting uh, sort of twist. So some of you guys are probably too young to remember these Warbird enthusiasts in Texas who started, you know, 40 years ago, something called the Confederate Air Force. And that didn't sell, <laughs> that name was no longer selling very well, so they had to change it to the Commemorative Air Force. And then this year at Oshkosh, they had doubled down on their new identity. They had a whole trailer there, and they brought out, uh, they had a movie, and they had some of the actual Tuskegee Airmen. So I was there with these two P-51 pilots. That was kind of a thrill. All run by the Confe former Confederate Air Force. Okay, and it's back in the federal hangar. Uh, if it's a whale or a sea turtle, it belongs to NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, the federal agency. And there's Kate from uh, our New England NOAA office. When the sea turtles uh, get stuck in the Gulf Stream and they wash up, on Cape Cod, uh, this guy Leslie Weinstein organization, and they um, coordinate pilots to volunteer to pick up the turtles in uh, boxes, banana boxes, and fly them back to uh, warm water. Uh, the interesting thing about this is uh, they can't go air cargo because the temperature control isn't tight enough. They can get too hot or too cold in the back of an airliner. Okay, now it's Oksana's turn to talk about Women Venture. Well, I didn't go there, so I was <laughs> Women Venture. There was some dinner and a photo, but again... And a free t-shirt. And a free t-shirt, which I didn't get, so uh, I don't know why. They ran out, <laughs> right? They, yeah, they, they ran out of those. So my venture was that I spent my time with the Yak 52 guys. Uh, so one cool thing about it is, uh, so they're all American, but this is a Russian airplane, so where's the... So, you know, it's funny to watch how they modify the Russian aircraft. So, one thing they did is uh, they, you know, F-52 is supposed to be an aerobatic trainer, so it doesn't have a, a lot of luggage space, but it does have hard points. So, one thing they did, they, you know, made this, like, bomb-looking thing, which is actually a cargo pod, so they can actually, you know, carry stuff in their airplane. So another thing they did was they installed a panic button. So guess what it's doing? It's doing nothing just there, you know, to scare the passengers away or something. Okay, next. All right. So we're Aksan and I agree that we saw about thirty percent of what we hoped to see, and uh, only about one percent of uh, what there was to see. Uh, as you can see, the one-week wonder was looking pretty good even on Friday. Uh, here we go to Mackinac Island. Mackinac Island had banned automobiles. You can look it up on Wikipedia, but I think it was 1898 when automobiles were invented. This little vacation resort uh, up near the Canadian border, they said, we don't want anything to do with these noisy things. They banned them and said you have to get around on a bicycle or on a horse. And it's still that way today. So you can see that picture in the middle here. There's the sign for the airport. There's the horse. Uh, all you can, the only powered vehicle you can operate as an individual on that island is an aircraft. So here we are flying over Lake Michigan to Mackinac. Uh, that's kind of the Grand Hotel. It's a huge hotel on the island. You can uh, 
rent your own horse and drive the horse around. You can rent a bike, which we did. It's about eight mile bike ride around the uh, island. I really recommend this if you're flying anywhere, you know, up near Detroit or uh, Milwaukee, uh, take that extra hour and a half or so uh, in a Cessna or an hour in a Cirrus and go up to uh, Mackinac Island. It's a lot of fun, even for a day. All right, then we went to uh, Toronto. Toronto has uh, the City Island Airport. I don't know how many of you all are familiar with this, but you can land essentially right in downtown Toronto. They have a little airport. Uh, there's the this, there's this city and there's the runway. It's a little hard to see in this photo, but it's right there. And uh, you're in the city as soon as you get out there, a five minute Uber ride from the heart of downtown. Uh, this is our friend's Metropolitan Soho Hotel. He's, got a, he's from Hong Kong, so he's got a killer Chinese restaurant in there. That's our Peking duck, which in Peking is just called duck. I think. <laughs> they have an amazing aquarium if you like public aquariums. At the bottom right there you see they uh, turned the uh, filtration system into an exhibit. Um, you got to see, uh, this will be the fate I think of a lot of older airplanes uh, pretty soon if uh, more young people like yourself don't learn to fly. Uh, and then uh, there's also the Toronto Art Museum. That's kind of, who's, raise your hand if you've seen Meet the Parents. That's kind of like uh, Owen Wilson's house where he salvaged the timbers from a seaman's chapel in Antarctica. Oh. <laughs> okay, so then we came back, Toronto to Syracuse to Bedford. Uh, we ended up stopping in, in Worcester. We didn't quite make it um, to uh, Bedford and refueling. I mean, you know, because we were so heavy with people and we wanted to stay, you know, right at the legal gross weight, we were super tight on fuel, fuel but, you know, flying right down to the legal um, VFR minimum is pretty scary. We learned that. Um, it uh, ended up being 15.2 uh, hours of hops time, so at an East Coast Aero Club retail price, that's about $3,000. Um, but again, we didn't go straight to Oshkosh or straight back. Uh, for me, for next year, uh, you know, I would do the camp. I would, I would camp again, but you know, if I'm going to go every year, I think I am going to start trying to go every year because it is such a great experience and a great community. But I think for next year, I'm on the waiting list for a dorm room at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. So they have uh, air-conditioned rooms that are hard to get and unair-conditioned rooms that are not hard to get. Uh, they run a shuttle bus to the heart of the show. One thing you know you get a little bit sick of is uh, the uh, kind of show food. It's fast foodie. So the summary, I guess, for me, you know, EAA really fights this tide towards bigger um, aircraft. A friend of mine who runs a charter company, he says, you know, the cost of complying with regulation. He's German. He says that the, the religion of the United States is regulatory compliance. He said, if you go back to the Middle Ages, all the time that people used to spend praying and going to church and having festival days, all that time that people in the Middle Ages put into religion, Americans put into regulatory compliance. Various kinds of corporate training, coming up with safety plans, filling out paperwork. So he basically says, if you have to do that, if you have to run your safety program and train everybody and put people in the sim and all these other things that are required for regulation, the cost of operating a Gulfstream, and he has a whole bunch of them, is not that different than the cost of operating you know, a midsize or even a uh, light jet. So he said, you know, in 10 years, the smallest GA plane will be a Gulfstream. Uh, against that backdrop, though, you have EAA. And the EAA guys are fighting that trend um, to a magnificent extent. You know, all over the country, GA is sort of, um, you know, under attack and sometimes withering. But more people go to Oshkosh every year. So I think now Oksana's going to yeah, so talk my, about her survey, informal my survey. Yeah, informal survey. So you know, Oshkosh is a place with a lot of like-minded people. And one thing I noticed, so I asked a bunch of people what brings you to Oshkosh, and they all gave me the same answer. Guess which one? There are like really only two options. I mean, one option is the airplane, but that's not what they told me. What they told me about people. So everybody comes to Oshkosh for a great uh, community. But then I asked them the other question, which was how many times have you been to Oshkosh? You know, obviously for every person the answer will be different, but they managed to answer it in a similar manner. So guess what they said? So they said, you know, I've been here for the first time in here, something, and then I came back every every year. 
Okay, that's that was my. Uh, Oh yeah, I guess these can be distributed, but if you want to copy this down, these slides are available at uh, tinyurl slash oshkosh2018 MIT with all the links. And then here's a bunch of links to, uh, I wrote up some weblog uh, articles on various things at Oshkosh. I'll go back to that in a minute. So yeah, so basically the, the, you know, Oshkosh is a safe space. If you tell people around MIT that you're gonna be flying, you know, in a Cessna 150, uh, it was uh, certified as uh, safe by the FAA, you know, in 1962. Um, they may question your uh, sanity and ask, you know, if you really need to uh, get to, uh, you know, New York, um, why don't you drive a Honda Accord or buy a JetBlue ticket? But nobody in Oshkosh will ever ask that. Yeah. They accept that uh, this is a valid desire to get up into the sky, even if, uh, you know, you're not in a state-of-the-art aircraft, and uh, even if it's something that you've built at home. All right, question time. Who has a brilliant question? Only a brilliant question. Also, feel free to come down and get more pizza if you want. That's uh, fun to go around. So. Yeah. And thanks for the wonderful talk. Yeah. Was this your first time at the Oshkosh? Mine first. I was there in 2003 and 2010. Did you fly a those events? Uh, I flew, let's see, I co piloted a Cessna business jet in 2010, and I flew a di kind of the opposite in terms of personal comfort a Diamond Star, a DA 40 in 2003. 